Welcome to the 8-bit theory. In a previous video I talked about displaying CGA low-res graphics on the Commodore 128 VDC chip. In this video we will add higher resolution graphics to the mix. CGA low-res featured 160 by 100 with 16 colors. What would be the next step? That would be EGA with a resolution of 320 by 216 colors. This is a resolution that was very common for games back in the day. And that's exactly what we're going to challenge on the Commodore 128 in this episode. A very little number of games featured specific support for the C128. Most games just had to be run in C64 mode. One game that had native C128 support was Ultima 5. It came on the same discs and because it also used the VIC-2 for graphics, it looked similar to C64 mode. However, on the C128 the game has faster loading times and adds background music. That's definitely better than nothing, but how could the game have looked like if it was using the VDC chip instead of the VIC-2? To get an idea, let's look at the 16-bit versions of Ultima 5. Especially the full screen artwork looks quite different from the 8-bit versions. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to make the C64 look bad here. Actually, I like the font much more on the C64 version and the VIC-2 is a class of its own. So, this is really about the difference and the technology behind. Which version you prefer, I will leave this completely up to you. These versions feature a 320 by 200 resolution. That's still not the full 640 by 200 of the VDC chip. Nonetheless, I think that's a good way of showing its capabilities. And maybe we can prove that the VDC is not just the ugly brother of the VIC-2, which is what you hear and read a lot on the internet. And keep in mind that 640x200 is only the pixel resolution of the VDC. The color resolution is really 80x100. Can this be a match for EGA adapters? I'll just give a rough overview real quick on how EGA compares to its predecessor CGA and also to the VDC. CGA and VDC both defined their 16 color palette as RGBI, meaning each of the primary colors can be combined and the result be available in low or high intensity. EGA adds one more bit, adding medium intensity to the mix. This results in a total of 64 possible colors. The EGA default 16 colors resemble CGA's text mode colors and the VDC chip's 16 colors. And very often, these colors were not changed in EGA games, which is also the case with Ultima 5. Before we hit the pixels, what does EGA actually bring to the table? Original EGA cards came with 64 kilobytes of VRAM that resembles the VDC's maximum supported memory. This makes them look equal at first sight, but the original EGA card could be extended to 192 kilobytes and to be frank, not a single manufacturer, except IBM itself, shipped their cards with only 64 kilobytes of VRAM. Besides that, EGA is capable of doing 640x350 in 16 colors, which is superior to the VDC's 640x200. We can increase the vertical resolution of the VDC chip to more than 200, but we will leave that for another video. For the timeline, CGA's lifespan went from 1981 to about 1985. EGA came in 1984, with clone boards being announced in late 1985. EGA stayed until it was replaced by VGA in 1989. The C128 DCR, that's the model that came with 64 kilobytes of VRAM, hit the market in the second half of 1986 and was discontinued in 1989. The price of an original EGA card was about $500, which is probably pretty close to the price of a Commodore 128D back then. Technically, it seems to me that the VDC chip sits right in the middle between CGA and EGA. And now pixels. I took the liberty and downloaded a screenshot of the DOS EGA version of Ultima 5 from Moby Games and loaded it into my image editor. Moby Games is a great source for comparisons like these as they feature screenshots of different versions side by side. 
I'll show you how to convert EGA graphics to the VDC format so you can do this too. It would be awesome to see an endless number of VDC conversions of EGA graphics appearing on the internet. I'm using Promotion NG here, which is also available in a free version. I paid for my version, so this is not product placement. The big plus with Promotion NG is that you can define color constraints, so I'll show you how. First, we scale the image to 640 by 200, because that's the resolution to which the constraints apply. Then we'll load the VDC color palette. While we are dealing with a 16 color image, the PNG file has the colors organized differently from what the VDC needs. Of course, this looks weird now, but when we choose resample colors, all will be fine again and with the correct palette. Now we set the constraints. Our color blocks are 8 by 2 pixels and we allow two colors per block. We can also limit the global number of colors to 16. This is not strictly required in our case because the palette doesn't allow for more anyways. And now by pressing Ctrl G the program toggles the color constraint violations. We can also add a grid that visualizes the color blocks. That's also 8 by 2 pixels and the key Alt G toggles the grid. And with some time to spare, I'll go and see if I can fix all of them. For most areas it's quite easy, for some it's tricky. But then, looking at other screenshots from other ports, I guess you just have to accept that platforms come with limitations, so I think we can just remove details while still having a good result. And that's it! I'm by no means a pixel artist, so this is just a quick and dirty proof of concept. Especially the avatar and Shamino have the most fine details. This is where we saw most violations. But when zooming out, I think the result is still great. I guess this took me less than an hour, so what could a professional do in that time? Now, to display this on the C128, we'll just store it as an uncompressed bitmap file with indexed colors. I'll flip the image vertically before saving, because the bitmap file format stores the pixels upside down, so rendering the bytes from top to bottom would also show the image upside down. I don't bother taking care about rendering bottom up, so I'll just go the easy way. Now when saving this file, I need to talk about file sizes. We're only looking at the bitmap file format now, not how data is organized in VDC memory. The image in 640x200 with 16 colors is just too large to load into C128's memory in a single go. A monochrome image of that resolution would take 16,000 bytes, as one byte contains 8 pixels. Here we are working with 16 colors, so one byte only contains 2 pixels. For 640x200, that leads to a file size of 64,000 bytes. No problem, we can go with 320 by 200 and just double the pixels as we render the image. This halves the required amount of memory for the file and for main memory. Then, unfortunately, I didn't find a way for Promotion to store it with 16 colors. Even though the palette is only 16 colors, the image was stored in 256 color format, with just 16 colors being used. If you know how this is done, please let me know in the comments. As a result, I ended up with a 320 by 200 file that again took 64,000 bytes of memory. So I used Urban View to store the image in 16 colors. There I also had to define the VDC palette so that the program wouldn't mess up the colors. Here you see the difference. The 256 color version takes a full byte per pixel. The 16 color version uses one nibble per pixel, effectively only taking half the space. Of course, we could work with more efficient image formats, but bitmap is uncompressed and easy to understand. If you're interested in compression algorithms on the C128, I recommend my video about basic microcompilers. For displaying this image, we have to write to two different address bases in VRAM. The screen RAM, which contains information whether a pixel should be shown in foreground or background color, and the attribute RAM, which defines foreground and background color for a specific block. Per default, these blocks are 8x8 pixels, 
but this can be reduced to 8 by 2 pixels. And that gives us a color resolution of 80 by 100 with a pixel resolution of 640 by 200. Getting a 320 by 200 image displayed under these constraints can really melt your brain. So I hope I'm not overcomplicating this. Working with two different screen layouts for pixels and colors is very confusing, so we try to handle these as unified as possible. Horizontally we deal with lines of 80 bytes for both layouts, that's good. One pixel in 320 by 200 equals two pixels in 640 by 200. So for every one pixel we read, we write two pixels. Vertically our image consists of 100 color blocks, so we should also try to do our pixel writing in 100 vertical iterations. Let's put this into an actual program. I'll do it in Commodore Basic as I always do, but it could be easily done in any language or on any other machine. While this will be slow, it is a one-time effort only. By the way, this is C64 Studio, my favorite IDE for coding Commodore programs. And just like in the video about CGA LORES, I'm going to use the VDC basic extension for any interaction with the VDC's register or memory. This extension makes working with the VDC chip much easier. Working with it and things like register setup are covered in more depth in the CGA LORES video, so make sure to also check that out for more details. One important thing about basic extensions in general, as they introduce new basic tokens, the IDE must be made aware of these, otherwise the basic interpreter won't recognize the new keywords. In C64 Studio you can do this by adding a dialect file to the corresponding folder. You can find the dialect file for VDC basic in today's episode's GitHub repository. The first part is just set up. We load VDC basic and activate it. Then we set up the VDC chip for our needs. These are VDC basic commands for writing to the registers. This tells the VDC that 64K of VRAM are available, this activates bitmap mode and this defines that a color block is two scan lines high. Also we are reducing the number of memory refreshes as much as possible and we set the start addresses of attribute and screen RAM. Finally we fill the VRAM so we don't clear the screen, no, we start with a screen full of black pixels which is probably the same. Then we load the image file and jump to the conversion algorithm. I won't go into the details of the bitmap header, you'll easily find the information online about Windows bitmaps. Just so much, we extract information about image width, size and color depth from the file. Now let me explain just real quick how the conversion is going to work. Each input byte contains two pixels. The green rounded rectangles represent one byte. The violet lines show the single pixels. And this is the VDC side where we have to double the horizontal pixels. In screen RAM one byte holds eight pixels. The same goes for attribute RAM. One byte is responsible for eight pixels. So to be able to write one byte to VDC VRAM we always need to collect the amount of data that's required to create one pixel byte and one color byte. That would be 4 bytes for 8 pixels. But as we are scaling a 320 by 200 image to 640 by 200 and any pixel will be written twice, 2 bytes are sufficient. We pick 2 bytes in line 570 and then we extract 4 nibbles to receive 4 pixel values. These go into 4 variables as hex strings p1 dollar to p4 dollar. We also have to check which two colors the color block in attribute RAM should have. Pixel 1 always uses background color, then we compare each subsequent pixel with the first one. The different ones will need to show the foreground color. Depending on which pixel is different, we are building the byte value. First pixel to foreground color is represented by a value of 128, second pixel is 64, then 32, then 16, etc. We want to write two output pixels per one input pixel, so if pixel 2 is foreground color, we set bits 4 and 5 to 1. In binary, this is 48. Bits 2 and 3 equals 12, bits 0 and 1 equals 3. Once we have the byte value sorted out, we write it to screen RAM. And then we run through the same steps again, 
for the second scan line of the color block. What we also do is we keep track of what the foreground color should be. We already sorted out any conflicts in the image editor, so there should only be one second color within the color block. After that, we build the byte that contains background and foreground color and write that to attribute RAM. As we are reading and writing two lines at once, we need to skip the addresses for input data and screen RAM. We are not skipping for attribute RAM, because there we only have half the vertical resolution anyways. And that's it! All that's left to do is dump the VRAM to the disk. VTR is the VDC basic command for copying from VRAM to main memory. Here I dump 24k of VDC RAM to the address right after where the bitmap file ends. The bsafe command finally writes the dump to disk. When you use variables for any of the parameters, these need to go into parentheses. Now let's run this. I know that many of you really love to tune algorithms for performance, so please feel free to improve this at your own discretion. All the code is available on GitHub for you to tinker with. The primary goal here is to create an understanding on how to do things and hopefully to provide understandable code. For ideas about tweaking for performance, I'll gladly refer to the YouTube channel with the hand that shows and tells. I've been a supporter of Robin's channel on Patreon for over a year now and it's definitely well worth it. By the way, I'm not showing this in original speed, this is about 10 times the original speed. The same algorithm in assembler is probably a couple hundred times faster. And we are well beyond the text part already and also the artwork seems to be rendered fine. Yeah, to me this looks pretty good. The only thing left is the viewer program for the VDC dump. It's pretty similar to the CGA low-res viewer. We just need to make sure the VDC's uh, registers are set up correctly, load the file and copy it to VRAM. RTV is the opposite command of VTR. It copies data from main memory to VRAM. Let's run this now. I'll show the viewer program in real time, including the full loading process. Loading with burst mode is really good. The 128 is such a great machine. When loading is done, it will print next to the three dots. The time between done and the image being shown will give you an impression on how fast the VTR command is. That took just about a second. I'll put the DOS EGA screenshot next to this. Feel free to pause the video and compare how much detail has been lost. And that's it for today. I have more topics on the agenda for the VDC chip. One thing I'd like to tackle next is hardware scrolling capabilities. And the other thing is the text mode. Actually, the VDC chip's text mode is capable of much more than what the kernel provides. So please make sure to subscribe to not miss any of that. If you like this video, feel free to like. Thanks, see you next time.